Hello. Well, today I'm continuing on with the Friday the 13th of franchise, and today is uh, where I talk about the ninth installment in the franchise, which is Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. This is quite notable for being the first film in the franchise to not have Friday the 13th, which is because this is the very first film New Line Cinema made after Paramount sold uh, the rights to Jason Voorhees and other aspects of the franchise to New Line, and then, you know, New Line wanted to then make Freddy vs. Jason but before that, they thought it'd be a good idea to, you know, uh, make a f film with Jason Voorhees. And they couldn't call it uh, Jason or Friday the 13th Part 9 due to the fact that Paramount owned that name. Um, and honestly, uh, let's uh, see about the alternative uh, cover and stuff. Well, there really uh, isn't much in one. Um, here, like the first one, there are two discs because this has a uh, the unrated cut. So he has this, and it says uh, Evil is has finally found a home. And here, Evil has finally found a home. Jason goes to hell. And he's not coming back. Still has that, but the back end is different um, than this. So, there is that. And then there are the discs. The, uh, Unrated version and theatrical version. Um, I think the theatrical version is not as good. Um, it's shorter. Plus, uh, you just don't get to have the overall, you know, the blood and stuff, of the effects that was put into the film. Uh, This film has, uh, you know, it's both versions of the film, unrated and theatrical. Um, theatrical version is 88 minutes, and the theatrical, or the unrated, is 91, so there you go. And uh, there's some new interviews, and uh, with Adam Marcus and Kane Hodder. This also has some, uh, a new commentary with director Adam Marcus, author Peter Brack, Bracky, uh, with an uh, additional TV footage with commentary from those two, as well as the original audio commentary as, see, as you could get on the uh, DVD version with Adam Marcus and writer Dean Laurie. Um, yeah, this film, uh, I guess you could say, it's fair to say I have quite a bit to talk about this movie. I do not really enjoy this film, and, and honestly, I was, after watching it and thinking about it, I thought, I remembered a, a comment I left on uh, Daisuke Beppu's video on this, which sort of expresses my overall thoughts on the movie better than I could really just sort of off the cuff do here I as I've done with the previous eight films um, I mean I've written lengthy comments on all those videos uh, that he did but I think this one in particular just sort of sums up my thoughts on these on this movie in particular 
Um, and uh, I've removed some stuff, but uh, yeah, I'm here to just uh, read from here, and uh, I hope you won't uh, mind overall this. Um, so, yes, Jason Goes to Hell is probably the film I'd rank the lowest in the franchise. I'm not a huge fan of... I'm not a huge fan of the direction the series took when New Lion released this film, which I still maintain. Uh, you know, things haven't changed from the time that I saw this after the getting the box set and watching this video, as well as been rewatching them these films for this series. And my thoughts haven't changed. Um, <clears throat> Body swapping is probably the big thing I'm not a fan of. Perhaps one of the things a lot of people talk about when critiquing the film. Um, the Evil Dead references take away some of the mythology we've gotten in the franchise. You know, at least to me. Um, and hearing Adam Marcus talk about the decisions he made in the commentary and interviews, not only for this release... Screen Factory release. Uh, but in other places, like documentaries and internet interviews, makes me think he wasn't as knowledgeable with the franchise as he initially thought. Um, you know, if for those who don't know, Adam Marcus was a, was a childhood friend of Noel Cunningham, the son of Sean Cunningham. Um... <laughs> And so he got to see Friday the 13th, the original, uh, uh, fairly early on before, you know, it was released in theaters. Uh, just due to him being friends with uh, his son, and also he's like enjoying horror films. Um, yeah, but, uh, and Sean Cunningham... Uh, Produced this film. It's the first time he has any involvement with the franchise after since the first film. Um, and I do kind of get into that a little later here. Um, but yeah, I don't think he he was as knowledgeable as he thought. Um, you know, particularly since it seems he may have missed or not paid close enough attention to the bar scene in part two that has Ginny, Paul, and Ted talk about Jason being alive. Conversation sounds like you survived drowning, washed up onto shore somewhere, in the, at least that's how I've always sort of interpreted it, and lived in the woods for years and later saw his mother killed. That's always been the implication to me. So, this whole thing, you know, with the film uh, where uh, Mrs. Voorhees is finding the Book of the Dead, reading from it uh, to bring back Jason. Uh, sort of contradicts what has been established in the franchise already. You know, it also seems like Adam is a bigger Evil Dead fan than Friday the 13th, but since he was best friends with Sean Cunningham's son, he was able to direct the first Friday the 13th and not the 90s, though, of course, since Paramount owned the title Friday the 13th, they could only use Jason Voorhees' name to ensure... Uh, fans who would know what the film is. Also, calling it The Final Friday didn't help it, since New Line acquired the rights, and wouldn't make sense to just end the series with their first film with Jason. You know, that, that also sort of... Uh, when I got the movie, having seen the previous films, and also, uh, well, I... Yeah, I got these movies when I was a teenager, I also had seen stuff on TV beforehand, so I was somewhat familiar, and then finally getting to the New Line films, when I got to part nine, it was just sort of odd to me. And then especially after seeing the films and then watching some of the stuff um, that came later, like with the documentaries, and you heard more about, you know, the process of wanting to do Freddy vs. Jason... And just how long it took until they could 
finally decide on a script and everything. It's just like their first outing with Jason Voorhees. They call the final chapter. Um, all right. Um, you know, I think the contradictory stuff in this film is what sort of gets me or gets at me whenever I watch this film. While the franchise hadn't hasn't been the best with the with continuity uh, regarding horror franchises, you know the first eight films did its best to ensure continuity flowed quite well regarding the story, and it actually did, you know, in the grand scheme of things overall. With the story from one to eight, there is a fairly consistent story, you know. Yeah, certain things here and there don't totally line up, uh, but story-wise, it does sort of make does its best to make sense. Um, you know, yeah, it did uh, did the best to tell a story overall. Since you know, almost every year in the '80s, there was a new Friday the Thirteenth film. They took breaks with the franchise in 1983 and 1987. Um, while I know the fact Paramount owning the first eight films may have caused some issues, it would have been nice for them to sort of explain briefly how Jason got back to Crystal Lake after uh, being in the sewers in New York, because, you know, that's exactly like the last time you see him in eight. He's also a little boy. How did any of this happen? I don't know, but there's stuff like, I guess, with the Book of the Dead, you know, more connections with uh, Evil Dead. Uh, and I'm not a huge fan of that. It's just, like, why <laughs> bring another franchise in when, obviously, they want to cross over with a specific franchise that New Line has. It's like we get... Get, because the director was a fan of Evil Dead, just wanted to bring Evil Dead elements. It's like, just, just don't. Just stop. But guess no one, uh, you know, thought anything otherwise. And also, he got the Book of the Dead for the movie because, uh, like, he knew somebody who could get it for him for, like, a day or so. He was able to get it and film scenes with it, and that's how... That ended up in the movie, and it's just, it's just something that I think would have, for me at least, would have been the best thing to uh, leave out. Just focus on Friday the 13th. I know you can't call it Friday the 13th, but do your best to just focus on this and just make the best story you can. Uh you know, yeah, Jason likely will die, but you don't need to call it the final Friday. And when at some point we're gonna get uh, Freddy versus Jason, so right off the bat, you know, that just is kind of uh, no. That's just a big no no, I think. <sighs> yeah. So. Yeah, and an explanation would have been nice from New York to getting back to Crystal Lake, uh, but we don't really get one at all. Uh, you know, it would have been cool to hear Creighton Duke talk more about that, since in this film he seems to be the authority of Jason Voorhees. Um, and, uh, you know, but because, you know, So that does ask a whole lot of questions, since, you know, we have never heard of this guy before, we have never seen him before, this is not Reggie at all from Part 5, um, and it would have made a lot more sense if, like, a character like Tommy Jarvis was in the movie to talk about all of this, but Tommy Jarvis is a Paramount character, you know, and same as Reggie. Um, So because of that, it's likely they couldn't, you know, get the rights to have them in this movie, like those characters, regardless if the actors were returned is another story. Um, but yeah, Creighton Duke being here, 
you know, tell us about Jason Voorhees and all this stuff. Just, you just have more questions about, you know, Creighton Duke. You know, he's like a bounty hunter, essentially, in the movie, but just fine and all, but... You know, that just is another thing. It makes just asks more questions than it answers. Yeah, that's a kind of a problem. Uh, at least for me. Um, the pacing of the film is also a bit fast. Uh, things are explained in a way we don't get all the answers from it. Um, and Adam Marcus did say this film was originally longer, but it was a lot more talky. And that didn't really fit a horror film like Friday the 13th. So there's sort of an excuse as to why it's fast-paced, as it would have slowed down the horror elements. Um, which, all right, you know. I guess, you know, it's... But, but I don't know. I just think there are certain things that could have been handled better, like just the... Just a brief explanation how he went from New York to Crystal Lake. You don't need, a, like, a monologue of sorts. Just, you know, maybe he was killing people along the way. And finally got to Crystal Lake, and then they killed him again, and then he was, you know, there uh, in the lake. Um, I don't know. Use imagination, I guess. Um that. Um, and I get to Sean Cunningham. And how um, Sean Cunningham uh, was also insisting to Adam uh, just to get the hockey mask out of the movie, which I don't think really helped the film, uh, at least for me. You know, not seeing Jason Voorhees with the exception of the bookends of the film, as well as being seen in a reflection in like Mirrors wasn't a very good decision, in my opinion, which also goes back to the body swapping stuff I mentioned before. And the title is a bit odd, since the film isn't meant to be the end of the franchise, um, due to the fact that, oh, spoiler alert, here you go, <laughs> which was actually a huge thing way back when this film came out, and one film they definitely wanted to have happen, the crossover, which it finally did, but was a decade away. You know, this was a little tease because you know Adam Mark is like, we're at New Line, they have Freddy Krueger, we could just do the ultimate sort of greatest thing with this ending, um, and that is, you know, Freddy Krueger's hand, his gloved hand comes up and drags Jason's hockey mask down to hell. You know, so again, that seems a bit odd, since this is not supposed to be the last installment of the franchise, since Freddy's hand comes up and takes his hockey mask to hell. And we also hear him laugh. And also that was Kane Hodder wearing the uh, sweater and the glove and dragged the mask down, in case you didn't know that. There you go. <clears throat> you know, and that was all to set up Freddy vs. Jason, which unfortunately, as I said previously, took another ten years to be made and released. You know, that, that ending is quite fantastic, and I imagine it was even better back when this film came out initially. You know, so here I've had a many negatives, which I don't think are too, you know, too, too negative, you know, um, in, t in the terms of following up the first eight, you get to this movie and there's all this stuff going on that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of connection to the previous films outside of Jason and Pamela Voorhees being mentioned and Crystal Lake and sort of bare minimum stuff, you know. And they're also like celebrating Jason in this film too. It's a little local diner. They have like Jason burgers, like making the patties into 
hockey masks for the church, which is a bit odd, I think. That the community would be doing that, you know. That community there would sort of embrace uh, somebody who murdered people. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting to see at least. Uh, now anyway, with the, let's get on to the positives. Um, so, mentioning some of the positives I have with the film, you know, the effects and some of the kills are quite fantastic, which I still do think so. Um, this part where uh, gets uh, the Jason in a in one body. Um, stabs, uh, like it's like a little, like a, it's not a stop sign, but it's <clears throat> like the little rail of a stop sign. It's two people in a tent, camping, having sex, comes up and stabs through the, uh, uh, tent and stabs the woman on top of the man and blood starts spraying burton everywhere and sort of like rips up and then kills the guy that's really cool um jason was blown up at the very beginning which i think is unfortunate um, though you see the mask is now um regenerating like kind of like growing around his mask like he's worn the mask for so long it's now sort of starting his skin sort of starting to attach to it odd. Also, since Jason is blown up and his body hopping, a descendant of Jason Voorhees is how he's going to be able to, you know, uh, get, you know, uh, get back to life, like in his own form, basically. Because uh, he is a back to life, but he's just some little <laughs> worm, snake, demon thing, crawling around, getting into people, and, yeah. Other positives I have, um, Creighton Duke, uh, was a great character, even though when one thinks about it, it's a bit odd, he knows so much about Jason, uh, the backstory as to how he knows about Jason was cut, and why he's hunting him, had it been included, would have made his character better in the final cut in either of the rated or unrated version you know preferably both but at the very least unrated that way you get a little more uh uh run time and more time with Creighton duke discussing this um steve and Jer jessica are fine characters um jessica is uh, related to jason Voorhees and um her mother is killed by Jason, and, uh, yeah, Steve goes to talk to her, and sees she's killed, and then he's accused of killing her, and, yeah, she's, like, with the, like, a sheriff, and, yeah, just a big misunderstanding occurs, um, Yeah, the performances are all are all pretty fine. You know, not horrible, but you know. Also, I guess you could say in some cases, not totally memorable. They're they're just fine. Kane Hodder as Jason is also fantastic, but I think it's unfortunate he didn't get to play him as much in the film. Though it was nice to see him outside in the costume in one of these films as the security one of the security guards standing by. Body to ensure Jason's body was protected. Uh, he's uh, you know, one of those guards in the beginning of the film. That also later Jason killed. So, in a way, Jason killed Jason. And also, as I mentioned, you know, he was. Kane Hodder was Jason's hand that takes his mask down to hell. Yeah. All in all, this is a film in the franchise that has some positives for me. That I'm able to have some enjoyment with a film I'm not a huge fan of. Mostly due to having some contradictory of the continuity of the previous films. Which 
for the franchise's story. It just doesn't totally add up. And then there's other decisions made in the film. You know, I don't skip this film whenever I marathon it, even though it's my least favorite. I know some skip around a franchise when marathoning the films. Uh, but I watch all of them, including my least favorites in a franchise. I know there are people that love this film a lot, and that's fine. Um, there are some things in the film that help me enjoy it to a degree, but this just isn't one of my favorite films. Uh, and yeah, I, that's, that's really where I stand. Not an incredible film in my eyes, but I know there are a lot of people who love it. Um, and yeah, I think Adam Marcus wasn't as knowledgeable of the franchise as he may have thought. Um, he was also the youngest director at age 23. This was his first film, feature film. He had just done, like, work on, like, as a PA on other films and also was, like, did some shorts. So he didn't have the biggest experience as a director when he made this. Um, so, you know, yeah, you could say that his youth and inexperience had a great deal as to why this film is the way that it is, and that either works for you, and is one of your favorites, perhaps, or you know, like, like me, and it's not one of your favorites. Or actually, for me, it's my least favorite, but, yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> I just don't enjoy it as much as others, and, um, yeah, it's fine if you like it, the more the merrier, but I've just never been a huge fan of this film, I know people who do love it, defend it, and that's fine, uh, if you enjoy this movie, that's great, um, I've just never been a huge fan of it, personally, um, but there are some aspects of it that I do like, and it's I think it's important to highlight those. Um, I believe Harry Manfredini did the soundtrack, and yes, he did. So there you go. If you like the music of the franchise, he uh, the guy who started it all with the themes and stuff for the first film is back at it, so, <clears throat> there you go, yeah, this is, a uh, yeah, I guess a more organized in a way, though I did try to go off the riff and all here and there, um, I know he had something to do with Texas Chainsaw 3D, and I've heard some people say he's tried to deflect it now, it wasn't his fault, that movie what ended up the way that it was, like, I think he was a producer or something, which, if that's the case, well, sort of, yeah. Uh, but, you know, maybe he did have more involvement in that. I don't totally know. Um, I'm, I'm more willing to not be as harsh on him for this film, since this was his first movie. You know, and likely he wanted to try and do the best he could, while also appealing to the producer, uh, hence why Jason really isn't in the movie much, you know, Sean Cunningham doesn't seem to be the biggest fan of Jason being a killer, for at least, that's what it seemed like early on, why he didn't do the sequels, but anyway, that's my overall thoughts on this film, uh, what do you think, do you enjoy it, do you dislike it? Tell me your thoughts if you like. Um, and yeah, that's really all I have to say. Hope you all have a great week. Have a great weekend. And just overall a good day. See you all next time.